This episode is sponsored by Kendo UI. Kendo UI allows you to build better apps faster. They have a comprehensive library ranging from data grids and charts to buttons and sliders. Plus, you can use their components as plain JavaScript as well as in Angular, React, and Vue. They have a large collection of customizable popular themes like Bootstrap and Material. Go check them out at javascriptjabber.com slash kendo UI. Hello, everybody, and welcome to JavaScript Jabber, another fantastic, amazing, wonderful episode. Today on our panel, we have A.J. O'Neill. Yo, 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 coming at you live is Cowboy of Halloween. And a special Halloween-y guest panelist, Jesse Sanders. A Halloween-y, okay, excellent. Yeah. Hey, everybody. <laughs> we have as our special guest, Sean Hunter. G'day, guys, coming to you from uh, Melbourne, Australia. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah. So, Sean, we're, we're here to talk about Aurelia, but first off, we definitely should get a little bit of a background on who you are, what you've been doing with your life, and what your favorite movie is. <laughs> mm, favorite movie? That's a tough one. I'll, I'll have to circle back to that. Um, How about favorite Vegemite dish? <laughs> favorite Vegemite dish? Well, yeah, I, I do like my Vegemite toast. Um, I think as uh, all Australians do, it's, it's kind of like a national requirement. Uh, you have to mm. be able to sing the national anthem and also have to love Vegemite. <laughs> but yeah, very thick Vegemite toast is ideal. The funny thing is, I guess, I can start a couple of years ago, my wife and I moved to the UK. Uh, so we're there for about uh, two years. And in, in, in the UK, they don't have Vegemite. Oh, they do, but they, they kind of promote this thing, um, alternative Marmite. It's not the same as Vegemite. And there's kind of like a war uh, between the two factions. And people in the UK like the flavor of uh, Marmite. Australians like Vegemite kind of like the uh, different factions of, uh, of JavaScript frameworks, which we can probably get into a bit today as well. But yeah, I was in the UK for a couple of years. That's where I kind of started using Aurelia, uh, which is a single page app framework, um, which I'll tell you a bit more about today. I was working for a, a startup over there and we, uh, we used Aurelia quite extensively right from the kind of early beta days. I did quite a few talks kind of up and down uh, the UK, which was awesome and met a lot of a lot of really cool people at various user groups all over the place. And then over the past year, um, kind of moved back to Australia, had a, a son, I had a baby last year. So that's been kind of, uh, it's been a busy year <laughs> to say the least with, uh, with writing a book and also... Wow. Um, kind of learning to be a parent at the same time is uh, is challenging. I wouldn't recommend uh, doing the two simultaneously. Congratulations, it's, by the yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, so it's been a, been a crazy couple of years, really. Let's start with an introduction to Aurelia and then give us sort of your connection and history with Aurelia. So and, maybe and like, like, you know. What I want to know yeah. is first, is it more like React or is it more like Vue or is it different entirely? And yeah, what is this? So or is it more like jQuery? <laughs> no, definitely not, not like jQuery. Um, yeah, so no, it's a good question. So uh, to start off with, I guess, ju just to give people the, the kind of elevator pitch if they haven't heard of Aurelia before, it's a single page app framework. So similar to other uh, frameworks that people might be familiar with, like Angular, React, or Vue. Um, it's most similar to Vue, I'd say, uh, out of those kind of frameworks. Uh, in some ways, it has a lot of similarities to uh, Ember.js, uh, if people have heard of that. So one of the things that kind of sets Aurelia aside from other single page app frameworks is that its focus on convention over configuration. So, for example, with the, the most basic example that I can think of is with Aurelia, you basically build your app up by creating components similar to most frameworks out there today. Each component consists of a view file, which is an HTML template, and a, a view model file, which is a JavaScript or these days typically a TypeScript file. Where in Angular, you would need to basically declare what template matches, uh, you know, corresponds to a given you know, JavaScript file, unless you're, say, putting them both in the same file, like I say, JSX or something like that. With Aurelia, the framework 
all you do is name the, the two corresponding pieces together. So you might have an app view, which would be the HTML file and an app view model, uh, the, the TypeScript file. And Aurelia will automatically look for the, the view file corresponding to that uh, view model file by name. And so that's just a simple example, but there's a lot of instances kind of throughout the framework where Aurelia leverages these conventions to mean that you, there's a lot less that you need to kind of tell the framework and a lot more it can just kind of figure it out by itself. And I guess what that means and the value of that is that when you're actually building up your app with these components, there's very little framework specific code you need to learn to begin with. But then also there's there's less to kind of maintain uh, as you're going forward as well. So most of what you write should just be plain old kind of TypeScript code with a little bit of framework sprinkled in where needed just to kind of give the framework cues for what it needs to do. So does that kind of make sense? It sounds like what you're saying is that, again, convention over configuration. So it's kind of documenting, this is what we think an app should look like. And it's providing some glue bits so that when files are in the right place, things come together. And it's, it's a, a little opinionated in the way that things are laid out and that it's, it's primarily TypeScript. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And so I guess initially people were, were mainly writing, building their applications with just pure JavaScript, kind of ES, yeah, at the time, ES kind of 2015 plus. Today, the, the Aurelia community has kind of mainly moved over to TypeScript uh, just because, you know, building larger scale apps, it's handy to have that, you know, that compile time checking and things like that. I like the the way you described it as opinionated. And that's a the good point. Aurelia is an, an opinionated framework. And those opinions are kind of codified in the conventions that Aurelia has. Okay. So is this something, I mean, it sounds like something where there's a, there's a build step is a definite part of it because you're going to have to convert from TypeScript to JavaScript. And so I'm assuming that that's where the convention comes into play, that it grabs the different files it needs and builds it together as a single page. So there is a build step. That's right. So um, typically you'll be using some kind of a, a bundler. So the most common way to do it would be to use Webpack today. So you'll basically run Webpack in the background. So you might say you'll write your component, you might save the TypeScript file, Webpack will, will be watching. So that'll kick in you know, transpile your TypeScript, create the bundle, but it's not actually until runtime. So if you look at a top level component, probably the easiest way to think about it is with an example. So if we say had a an app uh, that had a hello world custom element in it, uh, which is a component. So you would have your top level app uh, and then within your app HTML file, uh, you'd require in your Hello World component at the top level, uh, which would then be kind of loaded in by Webpack. You'd then use your Hello World custom element, uh, which would look similar if people familiar, are familiar with using a custom element in Vue or React. And then when the framework actually loads that app view, app view it will go uh, searching for the Hello World view model and it knows that it needs to find a corresponding view HTML file. So then it will basically load that as well. So it's at that kind of runtime step where it will find the view corresponding to the, the view model and kind of load those together for you. And at that point, it will go through something called the component life cycle uh, for that component. So in your TypeScript file, so you would have kind of going down the layers, we have our app component at the top level of our Hello World component below that. So it would then, Aurelia would then call the component life cycle hooks on your Hello World component to do as it's going through its life cycle. So the first thing it's going to do is call the constructor on the TypeScript file or the, you know, the, on, your, on your class. It's then going to fire off data binding. So that's something I can go into in a bit more detail if need be. Um, but there's data binding between the, the view and the view model. And then the view is, or when the component is basically ready to be attached to the DOM, calls another lifecycle hook called attached. 
And that is basically when if you need to do any DOM manipulation, say you might be wrapping a, a third party, you know, jQuery library or something like that, that's where you could do your DOM manipulation and then attach that, you know, attach your component into the DOM at that point. So that's basically from a high level, you have your app component and then you'd have many kind of sub components underneath that, uh, which are then composed together at, at runtime uh, using the conventions. I'm, I'm kind of new to all this. This is my first time getting a chance to take a look at Aurelia. And, you know, I'm fresh from coming back from the framework summit and, you know, taking a look at a lot of different frameworks. I'm primarily an Angular developer, but the, the first question I'd like to ask is why Aurelia over some of these other frameworks? What's what's the advantage besides, you know, what you were saying earlier about convention over configuration? What's the real draw there? And then also wondering, is there a CLI that goes with this to kind of help developers manage the bundling and managing Webpack? And, and then also want to kind of understand what's going on with the, you know, I'm looking here at the README example and getting my head around how is it um, actually matching the implementation file back to that HTML file? Is there some black magic there? Does this allow me to wire different implementations to the same HTML? Right. So, yeah, so lots of good uh, questions there. So I'll start at kind of the main point, which is what why someone might want to use Aurelia as opposed to one of the other frameworks. So the, the first is just, I guess, today, any framework that you pick, uh, you're going to be able to achieve the same kind of end result. So you're going to be able to build a fairly you know, complex and rich single page application, whether you pick React, uh, Angular, Vue, Aurelia, what have you. So for me, what it really comes down to is the style that you use when building the applications. So a lot of people and from discussions I've had in the past, people that, that are from kind of a, a Microsoft background using technologies like WPF or Silverlight, the development workflow feels very familiar if you've using, been using a model view, view model kind of a framework with those technologies in the past. So that's kind of one group of users that kind of tends to lean towards Aurelia. And then the other side of things is really just how uh, Aurelia kind of tends to get out of your way. So one of the things that is coming up soon is the Aurelia core team are releasing the next version which is basically a full rewrite uh, under the hood. But it looks like most of the top level APIs are going to be able to stay exactly the same. And that's because there's so little kind of framework code in there that when someone learns Aurelia, most of what they're learning is just you know, how to build a, a modern, you know, modern web application and the modern kind of browser APIs and things like that. So there's not a lot of uh, framework specific kind of stuff in there uh, that you need to worry about. So that's kind of the main reasons that people kind of tend to enjoy working with Aurelia. In terms of the the build process and uh, and managing the the bundling and things like that, yes, there's a CLI, and the CLI is actually how I kind of prefer to to get started with with my projects. So the CLI is just a a node module that you can install. And once you've installed the, the node module, it gives you options like creating a new application. When you're creating the application, you'd use the au new command, and that would give you options like, okay, do you want to use uh, JavaScript or TypeScript? Do you want to use Webpack or RequireJS? Do you want to use CSS or SAS? So then as it kind of steps you through, it's almost like a wizard process. You pick the different bits of your you know, front end build pipeline. And at the end of the process, the Aurelia CLI uh, will automatically spit out your Webpack configuration file and you know, the other things that you need to start your project. It also creates some of the, uh, the top level directories that you need in your Aurelia project so that you're kind of following you know, the standard way of building an Aurelia applications where you place your views and things like that. Was there any questions on the, the CLI before I kind of move on to the other questions? No, I think you covered those really, really well for me. I think that's really helpful for new developers that are coming in that might not be familiar with TypeScript or how to deal with that, how to bundle and do some of these, you know, uh, basic project things with the CLIs there. So great. So the, I guess the, the, the last question I had in there, sorry to throw so many things at you at once. I was just kind of making some notes as you were talking. 
was the uh, one is looking at the example, the HTML name, matching the implementation file. Um, I wasn't seeing anything on how those were happening implicitly. So I was wondering, or explicitly. So I was wondering what's actually occurring there. Is it implicitly happening? Is there a way to wire that up so I could have multiple implementations against one HTML? What does that look like? Yeah, sure thing. So it's a good question. And basically the way it works is uh, Aurelia has some some built-in conventions. So, so the, the convention that you're looking at there basically tells Aurelia to implicitly, if I don't tell you anything else, I want you to basically pick the look for the view model for the view corresponding to the, the view model by name. And if I do need to tell the framework more information, so for example, maybe I want to have a different view name. In that case, I could have the same view used by multiple view models, for example. And in that case, I can use a decorator at the top of my view model class. So in the Hello World example I was talking about, common convention would be to call the, the component uh, hello-world. So you'd have your hello-world TypeScript file uh, and corresponding HTML file. If I wanted to call it, you know, just hello, for example, the template file um, in the, the TypeScript class, I just add a decorator at the top um, and indicate that the, the view file is, is called, you know, and then just put in the view file name. And that way, you know, you can specify if you need to override the conventions. But what we typically see is that the conventions will kind of do what you need kind of 90% of the time. And then, you know, that extra, that other kind of 10%, you can just override it and give it hints. It's exactly what you mean. Another good example of what you might want to do is sometimes you don't want to actually create a, a view template. So for one of the examples, I had to do a an autocomplete control recently, and I didn't want uh, to create a, you know, a a template file for that. I actually wanted to generate the the HTML, HTML for that component dynamically in the within the TypeScript file. So then I can use a different decorator and say instead I want you to basically use this HTML that I'm generating for the component, or maybe an inline snippet of HTML inside the TypeScript file rather than you know using that default convention. So does that kind of does that kind of clear it up? Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. So you talked a lot about opinionated this basically of Aurelia. So I think that you know, for people that are familiar with at least one, if not more than one framework, there's kind of this spectrum, right, of opinionatedness. And Ember, I, I normally say tell people, well, React sits on one end and Ember sits on the other, and uh, other frameworks like maybe Angular sits somewhere in the middle. Where on that spectrum would you put Aurelia? Is it just as opinionated as Ember, more opinionated, less opinionated than Ember? I'd say that it's not quite as opinionated as Ember. And, and that's mainly because with Aurelia, there's not a lot of kind of Aurelia specific APIs. So whereas with Ember, it kind of, uh, and I'm not, I, I'm probably going to get <laughs> Ember people as telling me I'm saying the wrong thing because I'm not an, an Ember expert. But from my understanding, Ember dictates some more kind of strongly suggests you do certain things like in terms of how you fetch uh, data from the back end and things like that. Whereas Aurelia doesn't say anything about, you know, how you would say, you know, fetch data via Ajax. There's some common ways that people would do it, but, uh, you know, the, there's no conventions uh, built into the framework for that. So I'd say it's, it's kind of leaning towards Ember, but it doesn't go as far in that direction as Ember does. Hmm. Okay. And then I know that you've kind of given a little bit of this examples, but talking about opinionatedness, what are like some really solid examples of things that are not in a framework that's unopinionated, the choices that you have in a framework that's opinionated, how that leads you down a certain path? Like, do you have some really, do you have any additional examples to ones that on top of the ones you've already given of things like that? Like, all right, in Aurelia, when you're going to go do this, it's already set up to do this and that. So the main the main conventions are kind of the ones that I've I've spoken about with how it kind of yeah you know, how you marry up your components and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't think of other conventions kind of off the top of my head. Yeah, there's more kind of in the book, but yeah, I, off the top of my head, I can't think of some good examples there. 
Are you talking about the Aurelian action book, or you mean like in the book meaning uh, just yeah? Aurelian so the Aurelian action book. That's right. Yeah. Gotcha. I assume that it has like pretty strong opinions on. Uh, you don't choose your HTTP library. It's chosen for you, right? You don't choose your router. The router is already packaged in and chosen for you, right? Yeah, that's that's right. So you can use other libraries for, to do those pieces if you want to. But typically, most people use the choices kind of defined by their or created by their core team for that. So Aurelia has kind of call it like a full featured framework. So when you create an Aurelia application, you should have all the bits that you need to actually build a single page app. So that includes things like the HTTP uh, API, which is just a lightweight wrapper over the browser's fetch API. It kind of adds some extra bits and pieces like request tracking, the ability to auto-inject headers into all your requests and things like that. And then the router is another example of, of something that you, know, you would typically just use the Aurelia router, but if it doesn't fit your requirements, you could pull in a different one and plug it in if you needed to not really advised. An example where people kind of do is quite a lot of variety would be something like validation. So you could use the Aurelia validation plugin or there's many uh, plugins that people may be kind of already familiar with that do validation for other frameworks. So you could easily pull in a, a, a different validation library that they try to do like the core things that any SPA would need. There's a there's an implementation for you out of the box. So you don't need to go kind of searching for that. Gotcha. So I'm gonna I'm gonna phrase this in a different way because I, I think this is really important, you know, even if we beat it over the head 10 times. Um, <laughs> because uh, there's just so many frameworks out there. I want you to tell me why would I not pick Aurelia? Like, what are the reasons? Like, that I would n like. What are the values that if I if I don't have them, it wouldn't align with me? I wouldn't want to pick it. I think that's really key. In, in a way, like I think the why wouldn't I pick it is is maybe the best sell of why I would. Yeah. Okay. So that makes sense. So if you're from a, say a React world and you like having both the, if you like having everything contained for a component contained within the same, the single file, then with Aurelia, the framework's going to kind of fight you. You can do that, but the framework's not designed in a way that you could uh, do something like with JS, JSX, where you have the CSS, you know, the JavaScript slash TypeScript and the HTML all within the same file. So Aurelia like, prefers to, I guess this is a, an Aurelia opinion, is that you should really separate the presentation, the HTML and the TypeScript uh, and then the CSS as well. So if you prefer to have those all in one place, then something like React would be a better fit. Also, I guess one of the reasons why you, know, you might want to pick one of the bigger frameworks is that if you're looking for a, an application that has you know, the backing of a huge, uh, sorry, a, a framework that has the backing of a huge company, you know, things like you know, Angular is backed by Google, your Facebook back React, you know, Aurelia doesn't have a huge company backing it. It's really built by the community um, with various contributors all over the world. So if you prefer to have that kind of big company backing, then maybe Aurelia is not the kind of framework that you'd, you'd be interested in. For me, that's, that's actually a, a benefit of Aurelia because there's not just one company that decides the direction of where it's going to head. The community kind of decides that and, you know, if we get lots of different input from, from all over the place. So I, th I think that's a, actually a selling point for the framework. But again, if you want that kind of big company backing, Aurelia doesn't have it. So that's probably a couple of good ones to start with anyway. Uh, I think that was excellent. I, I think that that will actually help our listeners decide, you know, do my values align with this or do they not align with this? I, I think it's kind of funny, but sometimes the best sell is the, uh, the downplay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point. So since it's not backed by a, a larger group and it's more community based, what does the roadmap look like? And then what is that, you know, we, we've seen over the, the last few years of where some breaking changes happen in frameworks and other ones that are very community based sometimes take a lot longer for changes to get through versus um, other models. What's your opinion on that? 
Yeah, so at the moment, the core team, so typically the way the development happens within uh, the Aurelia framework is most of the the kind of core bits, like say the data binding or the router are kind of pushed forward by the core team. So they're the one that they're the ones that generally kind of produce the roadmap and, you know, announce things that kind of people can look forward to with the framework. So that might be some things like at the moment, uh, the core team is working on the, the next uh, version of the framework, which is smaller, lighter weight, and has some, some advantages in terms of the, the lower level APIs, making them kind of more intuitive, easier to use, and also then just adding some features as well to the framework. And that is due for, for release in kind of early, I think, alpha release early next year. But at the same time, the core team and also other community members are working on kind of more iterative and incremental enhancements to the, the current version of the framework as well. Uh, so that might be adding just a, a smaller feature like to the binding engine or uh, it might be, you know, enhancing the router or something like that. Um, something that's, you know, maybe it does make a di big difference to some people, but it's not that kind of game changing new feature, which is more likely to be announced kind of by the roadmap and at least kind of, you know, the, the core team would probably at least set the direction uh, that that should go in, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So I a quick question here. I'm pulling down. I was like, all right, while you're talking here, I'm going to go ahead and, and get the CLI down. And, and I'm going to go ahead and, and just uh, new up a new project and, and kind of take a look at, at what the CLI does. I look at it for how I would teach somebody else this. And, and the, the first problem I run into is I, I go to use uh, AU, a new command, and it comes back and says, no Aurelia project found. And I'm, I'm kind of stuck. Yeah, so that's where the CLI will kind of give you some hints as to what's going on. What you would typically do there is, is just specify the project name that you're trying to create in Aurelia, and that should then go and create it for you. So if you say, um, say we're creating a Hello World example, if you, you do AU new Hello World, that should create a new Aurelia project called Hello World, uh, and then initiate the wizard so you can then start filling in the next options. All right, I still get the same error. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe there's something wrong with the configuration on my machine, but I need well, I'm coding on the show, I love this. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this is new, I love the new tech and, and explore it, and, and it sounds like really cool stuff. So, Jesse, uh, here's my yeah. idea for how to solve your problem. Stand up on your desk and as loud as you can say, does anybody know anything about computers? <laughs> oh, have you tried bro. turning it on and off again <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i've rebooted four times <laughs> um, so sean what other frameworks do you have experience with yeah so um good question i started working with uh single page apps back probably about 2010 and back in those days i was work working a lot with backbone uh, and mm -hmm. and then marionette and then kind of as we were kind of building applications, Backbone did did a good job for some stuff, but we found it was kind of getting a bit unwieldy trying to manage mainly, you know, all of the different events between different parts in the application and uh, the UI updating and things like that. It was, it was getting kind of unwieldy when we're getting to larger scale apps with that. So then we looked at uh, Angular 1 uh, at that point. 
and that was that was kind of nice in terms of having the the data binding and uh, and routing and things like that kind of baked into the framework, uh, which you kind of had to go searching for in the early days of Backbone. And I, I really enjoyed working with with Angular One, and where I kind of um, you know moved on to Aurelia from there was when we're kind of picking a new framework for a project we were going to work on. And at that point, we were deciding, okay, do we choose Angular 2? And at that point, Angular 2 wasn't, hadn't been kind of released yet. And it was a pretty drastic change from Angular 1. Or uh, do we kind of, you know, look at something different? So that's where I kind of um, started having a play with Aurelia and just really, really kind of fell in love with the conventions, the clean code, the, the style uh, of building the components in this framework. So I've, from there, I've kind of mainly used Aurelia. And today we're, we're replacing one of our older legacy backbone applications with Aurelia, which is, has been great fun. And I do kind of play with Vue and a bit and, and other frameworks as well. But typically today, most of my, my time is spent with, with Aurelia. Gotcha. Tell us about the performance with uh, Aurelia. So, yeah, so Aurelia, and I haven't looked at the benchmarks in a while. Back when I was doing a lot of talks and a year or so ago, I was looking at the benchmarks all the time because that's one of the, the questions people uh, tend to ask. At the time that I looked, last time I looked, um, the, the performance was kind of comparable. And of course, performance can be measured in a number of different ways. And depending on what the requirements are for your application, you know, the, you we're going to have different uh, performance characteristics that you need to kind of optimize for. With the applications that I've built with Aurelia, the performance has, has always been good enough that it's not an issue. So I've uh, had hundreds of components uh, rendering on a page the probably the most intensive UI that I had that would have pushed the performance on the rendering side was a dashboard uh, screen that had I think about 20 charts or something on it all kind of refreshing and updating in real time from data feeds on the back end and with that didn't notice any kind of performance degradation or you know delays in the rendering um, getting pushed to the to the client. Aurelia is, uh, has a slight, slightly different approach than some of the other frameworks today. So uh, in terms of maintaining that good performance. So where React uses the, the virtual DOM, Aurelia doesn't do that. Instead, it uses the concept of observables and the browser mutation observer API. And it will basically, so it will basically listen for changes on your view models and then basically push those through the mutation observer and get your updates rendered. So you don't need to have kind of any background loops running to watch for changes like you would have had to in the, the old days with Angular 1. But, you know, it still achieves that same performance characteristic that we see with the modern frameworks without the need for a virtual DOM. Nice. I have a quick question. You said that um, you threw out the magic word. I heard you say observables. So is this using the RxJS library or do they have their own implementation? So they have their own implementation for observables. And for the most part, it's kind of transparent for someone using the framework. So all you would do is set up a property on the, the view model and uh, Aurelia will take care of, of basically listening for changes on that. And also, you know, correspondingly, if you have a field on the view, you can, you can bind that uh, to the corresponding field on the view model. And the Aurelia's uh, internal implementation will take care of listening for changes in a way that's relevant for that type of element. So, for example, with an input element, it's going to listen for you know, the blur event on the input, and then it's going to basically trigger the change at that point. So take it one step further. One of the Aurelia modules, uh, which people are using a lot today, is called Aurelia Store. And that uses RxJS under the hood as kind of a, an Aurelia Store being the state management plugin for Aurelia. So what people are kind of moving towards now is, yeah, for the kind of data binding scenario that I mentioned um, 
just before where you've got a, a view binding to a view model is great for simple scenarios. But as you get you know, pages with many applications, each which need to be aware of each other's you know, or, or kind of global state, then there's a need for something, you know, that's a bit more heavy duty in terms of architecture. So that's where people will pull in the uh, Aurelius Store plugin, uh, which uh, uses, leverages um, RxJS under the hood to kind of watch for changes in that state and reflect that back up to their components. Is that a, a traditional Redux pattern? I'm not a Redux expert. From what I've kind of read, it follows similar concepts to Redux. So it's it's got a lot of the same kind of pieces like actions state that basically gets kind of mutated in one place and you maintain a history of that state over time so that you can do things like jump bit back, you know, back and forward in history. So it has a has many similarities with something like Redux, but some differences. And I can't go into the the full detail of what those differences are because I'm, I'm kind of not not a Redux expert. Well, next time you go on the show, keep that in mind that we typically prefer people that are experts in everything. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. So, but I did have another question for you, which is, well, it, this is inspired, first of all, by Justin McMurdy gave a talk at Utah JS conference entitled "Liberating Your Application from Framework Tyranny." And I I don't know if he said it exactly this way, but what it incited me to believe is that we're doing too much with SPAs. Like they have their place, but we're like trying to bundle eight or nine different applications into a single application. And perhaps we should look at these more like microservices and where, you know, one page that does one application is its own application. And another page that really handles another application is its own application. So what are your thoughts on the idea of having multiple SPAs as part of your flow or the way that you build your larger application? Yeah, I think that I think that can definitely make sense. So one example of uh, where we're looking at doing that for an application I'm currently working on is the there's two kind of main sections of the application. There's the area that most users will use, and then there's the admin area. So the admin area is probably not going to be used by most most people, and uh, it, there's it's probably not going to have much shared state with the or shared functionality with the main application either. So uh, in in a way, it would kind of make sense to split that off into its own kind of little SPA island. Uh, So at the top level, we're using ASP.NET Core for our server-side kind of framework. Um, So uh, we could have two kind of top level routes, a a main route for the application and then a slash admin route, which would then pull in that, um, you know, that admin application, which could be its own kind of uh, standalone Aurelia application. And I kind of like that from a cleanness perspective, right? You're not kind of overcomplicating the main application with bits that it doesn't kind of need to know about. So I think that can make sense where I think I think you can go too far that way, though, if you do have bits of your application, which really should be all a part of the same app. So, for example, uh, with Google Docs, you open a, a file in Google Docs, really that all feels like this, the same application to me. So I wouldn't see a see like a logical way to kind of split that up uh, into um, separate kind of application pieces. So I think where you've got like a natural split, uh, like say a main and then an admin area where they're not going to be sharing uh, too much uh, between the two bits of the application, I think it makes a lot of sense. Cool. I'm interested, though, to hear what some of your opinions are on on that. Have you kind of tried kind of that splitting approach of splitting the applications into into various pieces? I haven't tried it yet, but I am looking for an opportunity to do so because there's some amount of code duplication if you're if you're going to do something like that. You know, even between your admin and your front facing, because you're going to have some, you know, shared models and whatnot. But I've um, I've been developing in Go a lot more lately, and I've come to appreciate that dry is not always the right pattern. Sometimes dry is the anti pattern. Sometimes it's actually easier to navigate code and to find bugs and to fix it when you are just duplicating things rather than trying to force them into the same 
framework in, in two places. Sometimes it's, you know, it's okay to go fix a bug in two places when it's easier to find the bug in either place or, you know, that kind of thing. I don't know if that quite makes sense, but, um, so, so it's something I'm, I'm more interested in and I'm more, I'm more lenient to the idea of there being some duplication because the trade-off in the benefits are, you know, would just work in a different way. Yeah, I think some sometimes people can go too far, kind of drink the dry Kool-Aid and end up making the code so complex just to avoid at all costs <laughs> repeating themselves. So if you end up making the code that complex that you need to spend kind of 10 minutes really just understanding the structure before you can fix a bug, then yeah, I think you may have gone, <laughs> gone too far down the, down the dry path. And, and I have encountered that quite a lot where... And I've even created that myself, you know, where things are so dynamic and so tight that when you go to find a problem, it's seven layers deep and you're just following one function after the next function after the next function. And the code is, you know, clean, so to say, but very difficult to discover. Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've seen that a lot myself. And it's, it's that, you know, that urge you get that as, as a developer, really just to avoid that at all costs. So you, when you put in and something, you, you basically you start repeating yourself. It's that kind of gut reaction of just, you know, <laughs> I need to, I need to make this, I need to add an abstraction, I need to kind of avoid it. But yeah, it's, uh, you can definitely get yourself into a, <laughs> a bad place doing that as well. That well, balance. And- and Chris and I, Chris isn't on the show today, but he and I are, are both anti-framework in the sense that we we prefer to start from, you know, a, a fresh palette and kind of see where things go and if, if a framework fits rather than to start with a framework and start boilerplating kind of be, because of that. Like anytime you use a framework, you accept a certain set of constraints, which probably most of the time is the right set of constraints. And, you know, you're going to go down the happy path. But I, I think that it's also worth exploring. I, I don't know. I guess I'd say frameworks are great for learning and they're great for when you need to repeat a process that you did before that worked well in a new place. But I, I think everybody should take the time to, to go through the challenge of not using a framework on one or two projects to kind of learn you know, where the values are and maybe discover that the framework they're using has been constraining them in a way that's been drying up things that don't need to be dry. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely think there's a lot of merit in that. And I think you're pretty wild. I like my <laughs> frameworks. I like them a lot. So I just which, saw a really which frameworks in- do you like though, Joe? Um well, pretty much everyone I've used, to be honest, right? <laughs> I started off with a little bit of knockout, did some backbone. I did not do Marionette, but I checked it out mm. pretty so significantly. AngularJS, React, View, Angular. Joe, did, didn't your mother tell you that if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything? That sounds like <laughs> what's happening here. I, I have a love affair with all frameworks, I think. <laughs> I believe that that is true. So, I think, I think um, I'm more in the middle. Having, having come from one of the original versions of jQuery and and jQuery UI widget factory patterns and kind of up through Dojo, Backbone, Ember, and and then into Angular. I mean, I can appreciate what you're saying, AJ. I just, having been there once and and having dealt without a framework, it's difficult to be able to go back and say, hey, I'm going to take all those things and set it aside. Yeah, I I like me some Angular and and, uh, some frameworks. So kind of in in, in between there. And I I don't think that frameworks are always bad. I just think that they are... Mostly when it's the bad. first tool in your toolbox, I, I think I I believe that the better way is to iterate slowly, to take something small and gradually add to it, and not make it too complex up front. I think with a lot of frameworks, there's just a there's a lot of there's a lot of complexity and there's a lot of learning, which is good learning. But it, I don't think it's always necessary. I'm not saying that you should never use one. I'm just saying use with caution and learn and grow to find the fit rather than just reaching for the hot newness. I think a good example of that is is jQuery, right? So for for the longest time, people weren't learning uh, the latest browser APIs, which are actually quite good today uh, because their experience with with JavaScript was jQuery. So a good exercise today uh, for people that have always just used jQuery is try to build an application without using jQuery at all. And, and actually, you can get done 
basically everything you need to get done without need, needing to even use that at all and just use the native browser APIs. And I think, oh. yeah, start off with something small uh, rather than maybe your whole application and maybe a good way to start. The funny thing there, though, is that jQuery was JavaScript, whereas the DOM was not. It was C++ APIs. And that the DOM ultimately adopted almost all of what jQuery set forth. I mean, everything that we have today is pretty much a result of jQuery having implemented it and then the DOM going back and backwards implementing it in a less beautiful way. Right. And I think that's that happens uh, like a lot. Um, and it's said it should happen is frameworks kind of go and push the limits and go, well, if we were designing, if we're building applications and we had everything that we need in the, bo in the box, in the browser, what would it look like? So I think it, a lot of things that you know, get added to frameworks and then, um, you know, if, if it seems to be a great thing across the board, then it kind of makes its way back into the, uh, into the browser uh, API, which is, yeah, I think it's great when that happens. Yeah, me too. And, and I think one nice thing about most frameworks is that you get to learn JavaScript instead of learning a C++ wraparound layer on top of JavaScript. But then most of the frameworks aren't in JavaScript anymore either. But, you know, because the DOM is a terrible way to learn JavaScript because you don't have a raise objects don't work properly, functions don't work properly. Like in the DOM, everything is a shim around C++ or in, in the, some of the, the new Firefox browsers, I think they, they're starting to implement some Rust. But it's, it's not a, actually a JavaScript API, and so you go to call.map on something and it's not there. So mm -hmm. I, I do like that when you're using frameworks, you typically are using more JavaScript-esque code as opposed to the raw DOM. But I think learning raw DOM is super important. Okay, so as I'm kind of poking around here, looking through the documentation, I was looking at stuff on the router configuration. That seems really simple to be able to set up routes and, and be able to create some nice strategies there for how to navigate through my application. Is there anything like lazy loading supported uh, within that, that router currently? So there's basically the the way that it currently works is that typically I described earlier the component life cycle. So components also have a uh, when you when you're using a component uh, that uh, has been initiated um, from a from a router, for example, um, you might have you know, a slash a slash contact route, for example. That contact route uh, or uh, that view model and component corresponding to that route would be, I would call it a page. And that page component has a separate set of lifecycle events. One of those is activate. So one of the things that you can do in the activate lifecycle event, it's just a method on your view model, is basically call an asynchronous API and return a promise. Uh, so you might uh, so fetch, do a JavaScript, uh, sorry, an Ajax fetch, and then asynchronously then load the data back up. So that's how you can kind of get some asynchronous functionality in terms of your components that are loaded as a result of the router, if that makes sense. Yeah, great, awesome. One last question, because as I'm starting to build an application in this, the one thing that, that starts to come out to me is how do we manage complexity? And, and uh, you talked about the Aurelia store and the state management, but the other thing I was wondering is, how does messaging um, work between components? Yeah, so there's a couple of ways that you can handle that. For simple scenarios, you can start by passing, you can kind of follow just a, a simple pattern, uh, which is uh, called, I think, it, and I think it came out of maybe the, the Amber community to start off with called data down uh, actions up. So in that case, you could basically use data binding to pass data down the component hierarchy um, from the, the top level um, down to the low level, lower level components. And then when something happens, so maybe at somewhere down the component hierarchy, a button is clicked uh, and maybe um, that 
you define that as being like a user created action or something like that. You can then use something called Aurelia's event aggregator uh, to basically publish an event which then is a user-created event, which then other components uh, in the application uh, could subscribe to. Basically, the other components would also take a dependency on the event aggregator. Uh, they'd, uh, Aurelia uses dependency injection, uh, so they would take a, and, and the event aggregator is a singleton within the application. So you'd, within the the listening component, you would take a dependency on the event aggregator, subscribe to that user created event, and then maybe do what you need to do at, at the top level. So maybe you show a, a message to indicate that, to give the user some feedback that, uh, that there's been a, a user creation event. You could also then approach that if you get into uh, you know, a more complex scale by doing all of that through the Aurelia store. The Aurelia website, aurelia.io, has a great documentation page on, on what that would look like uh, with the Aurelia store. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Uh, it has things like how you would subscribe to a stream of states and things like that. Great. That's awesome. That's great to hear. It uh, sounds like it's a pretty close... Uh, pattern from what most of us seen with Container Presenter, and so we'd be able to apply, apply that pattern right into Aurelia. So that's that's really good to hear. Awesome! Thanks so much for answering the questions. Awesome. It seems like we've kind of come to time. Should we go ahead and wrap up? Yeah, let's wrap up. I'll start off with Pix. Is your job search stuck? Maybe you're not getting any interviews with employers, or maybe you are, but no job offers, or you may be new and not even know where to start. This is Charles Maxwood, and I'm releasing a new course and ebook on how to find a job as a software developer. The course walks you through the process of finding the types of companies you want to work for, getting their attention, and putting your best foot forward as the candidate they want. I've coached dozens of developers in looking for jobs and have been able to help several people find jobs within two weeks to two months. So whether you're new to development, can't find a great job that fits what you want, or are looking for remote work from an area without a strong tech community, I can help. Go to getacoderjob.com and sign up today. I just attended React Conf and had a fantastic time down in Las Vegas, Nevada, way up in the hills of, in Henderson. So really not in Las Vegas, Nevada, at this fantastic resort on a lake, not a casino in sight. It was just fantastic. Had a really good time. So I highly recommend React Conf next year. Uh, tickets are nearly impossible to get, so keep that in mind. And uh, if you're looking for something a little bit more on the lighter side of things, I've been reading this series of choose-your-own-adventure books called Endless Quest, which are Dungeons & Dragons-themed choose-your-own-adventure books. And on the drive to, to and from Las Vegas, my wife and I drove together, and she read the books, and I, together, the two of us, made choices as to what, we would, what choice we would make, and we really had a good time. They were really fun, very enjoyable books. So if that is up your alley at all, I can highly recommend those. And those are my picks. AJ, are you ready yet? Yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. A couple of cool things. I'm listening to Extreme Ownership. I think I mentioned last week that that was either on my list or that I I, I think I just finished the previous book, uh, which was because because Chuck recommended it. I'm enjoying it. Um, I haven't got enough into the meat of it to to really say uh, how how much or how little, but the the core principle is basically take responsibility for everything that happens in your life, whether it's a decision that's made by someone above you or someone below you, you know, if you're if you're part of the decision chain on something, take responsibility for it and um, look at look at how look at how you can empower yourself with that mentality. You know, because there's there's the victim mentality of I'm not empowered, you know, I'm a loser, and then there's the empower mentality of this happened because I made a mistake, because I didn't learn enough, because I was in the wrong place at the wrong time, because I was in the right place at the right time, because I did learn, you know. And, and so I, I think that that's a really good mentality to have. And then uh, you know, not to disrespect that, you know, things happen in life that are beyond our control. But if we look for ways, even when something seems to be beyond our control, if we look for ways to, to take responsibility for it, that general pattern is going to produce a, a more rich uh, and successful life. And so I, I think that that's, that's probably true. I've, I've been loving programming in Go. I've mentioned several times that I'm doing that now. Um, I, I highly recommend to everyone, you know, learn more than one language. And I think that if you're a JavaScript developer, you might feel right at home uh, with Go because it's, uh, it, it's kind of like 
you know, JavaScript is the JavaScript of the Python and Ruby world, and Go is the JavaScript of the C++ and Java world. Also, one, one other thing that I thought was really cool, there's a company called Harry's that does um, men's grooming. So they started out with uh, kind of this competition to Dollar Shave Club, and then they've expanded into doing like some body, what's body shampoo called? It's not called shampoo. Anyway, that thing and some other stuff. And now they just recently split into a, a woman's company as well called Flamingo. And, and I, I think it's really cool to have a company that is in two uh, similar but different markets with a different marketing strategy. And I, I just kind of like the way that they're, they're approaching that as opposed to like Gillette has Gillette for men and Gillette for women. Harry's has Harry's and then it has Flamingo. And I'm, I just, as a business strategy, I think it's really interesting and I'm interested to follow their, their success with that. All right. I've got great, great uh, picks there. I've got two picks for you. I, I really like the the positive message piece. And so this isn't something I'd usually bring up, but it's something that I've been focusing on lately. And it's called The Miracle Morning. It's a uh, audio book that I've been reading about um, getting everything done before 8 a.m. in the morning. I know, Joe, this is way after or way before you wake up. but Yeah, uh, way before. Way before, right? <laughs> Shortly after I go to bed. Certainly. So um, I've been, really been enjoying that. Um, the other thing I'm seeing a lot of buzz on that I'm really excited to dig in and understand more um, is React Hooks. Hear a lot of uh, buzz about this and wanting to get up to speed on that, understand it, and then how we might possibly um, integrate that into other frameworks. Outside of that, I have been going crazy with Apple products lately. I just got the new iPhone XS Max, and I just literally hours before I got on here, I uh, got the new Apple Watch 4. So trying to figure out all the crazy functions on that, but it seems like a lot of fun. So thanks uh, for, for having me today. Really appreciate it. Cool. So I guess I, I can jump in with my picks now. So yeah, that's, that's just some great picks, guys. Um, I've read uh, Extreme Ownership um, and Miracle Morning, both fantastic books. So I, I definitely recommend uh, people check them out. In terms of my picks, I've been listening to an audio book the last week or so um, called uh, It Doesn't Have to Be Crazy at Work, uh, which is by the guys from Basecamp. Um, and really enjoying it. It's, it kind of goes through um, how at Basecamp they try to create a stress-free uh, kind of working environment, how it kind of this, this fight against the general kind of approach in business these days where everyone has to be hectic and, you know, all emails uh, are flagged with important and things like that. So it's how, how can we adopt certain strategies within our businesses to make sure that it's kind of a, a calm uh, environment where things are planned out and done properly rather than just being sporadic and chaotic all the time. Um, so I think <laughs> I could yeah, definitely, uh, all, most businesses could do with being a lot calmer. The other pick uh, that I've got is my book. So um, if you're interested in in learning a bit more about Aurelia, you can check out uh, Aurelia in Action. It's published by Manning and we should have have in the, the show links a, a discount code uh, for listeners uh, of the show as well to get uh, to get a discount on the book. And my final pick is yeah, for um, I've been using the the Apple Watch um, three I think for the last uh, six months, and I'm an a avid swimmer, and uh, I really like the activities app on the on the Apple Watch to be able to track things like you know if you're doing doing a swimming set. Uh, it'll track all your intervals and timings and everything like that for you. So, um, so I think yeah, I hadn't used a smartwatch before this year, but I've been really enjoying it. So that's it, it. My picks, I think. Hey, I got a question for you on that. Does it know when you've like hit the end of the lap and turned around? It does actually, yeah. So it, it records your laps. It also automatically splits your sets up. So if you do say like a, a 2K set and you're doing like maybe intervals of 100 or 200 meters, it will automatically track those intervals for you. And it's even smart enough to detect if you're changing strokes. So maybe you're doing some freestyle and then some butterfly or something like that. So it's it actually picks up uh, your strokes uh, and things like that to a pretty high degree of accuracy as well, which is pretty impressive. That is impressive. 
Okay. Well, thanks for being on the show, Sean. We've really had a uh, good time, a very interesting discussion. And uh, thanks to AJ and Jesse, of course, for being on our panel. And thanks to everybody for listening. We will catch all of you another week. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.